This is the Colosseum, where 400,000 men met their brutal end. These fights weren't just savage, they were rigged, designed to manipulate and control the masses. But what if I told you that these deadly games were part of a grander scheme? A scheme that might have helped bring down the Roman Empire itself. The Colosseum, one of the most iconic landmarks of ancient Rome. Standing tall for nearly two millennia, it's magnificent and awe-inspiring. A testament to Rome's engineering prowess and a stark reminder of its brutal past. As you stroll across the vast center of the Colosseum, imagine the faint echoes of the past, the roar of the crowd, the clash of the steel, the cries of the gladiator. This arena, once a deadly playground where blood and broken bones became a source of vicious pleasure, now draws admiration for its architectural brilliance. But to fully appreciate the Colosseum, we need to take a step back and start from the beginning. In AD 70, Rome was in the aftermath of civil wars and political chaos. Three emperors had fallen in quick succession. Galba lacked military charisma. Otho took his own life, and Vitellius could not stabilize the empire. Enter Vespasian, the empire's newest leader, a man who understood the necessity of restoring legitimacy to the throne. Desperate to win the hearts of people and to secure his grip on power, Vespasian needed a grand gesture, a symbol of Rome's renewed strength. This grand gesture came in the form of the Colosseum, or the Flavian Amphitheater as it was originally known. Built on the site of Nero's infamous Golden House, it was designed to erase the memory of the tyrant emperor whose reign had been marked by cruelty. Nero's demise had left a bitter taste in the mouths of Romans, and the Colosseum was meant to be a gift. A gift that symbolized Rome's ability to rise from the ashes of tyranny and destruction. The construction of the Colosseum began in AD 70 and took 10 years to complete. Standing at an impressive 48 meters high and 189 meters in length, the Colosseum could accommodate up to 80,000 spectators a feat of engineering that remains awe-inspiring even today. For comparison, this is roughly the size of a modern-day stadium, like the one used for the Super Bowl. When it was originally completed in AD 80, Vespasian's son, Emperor Titus, held a grand inauguration that lasted 100 days. This wasn't just a celebration. It was a spectacle designed to showcase the power of Rome and the might of its rulers. For the next four centuries, the Colosseum would serve as the premier venue for some of the most brutal spectacles in Roman history. A place where gladiators fought to the death, wild animals were hunted to extinction, and public executions were carried out before cheering crowds. The games were more than entertainment. They were a way for Rome to project its power, both internally and externally. They served as a reminder to the Roman people of the strength of their leaders and the might of their empire. Now, you're probably wondering, how did they go from slaughtering animals to gladiator fights? Whose idea was this? And what was it like to be a gladiator? Imagine standing in the arena, the sun blazing down on you, the sand sticking to your skin as you struggle to catch your breath. You're not a noble warrior, but a slave, a prisoner of war, or perhaps a condemned criminal. In front of you stands another man, equally desperate, equally afraid. You know that only one of you will leave this arena alive. This was the life of a gladiator, a life of violence, fear, and uncertainty. The gladiatorial games are one of the most iconic aspects of the Colosseum's history. But the reality of these games was far from the romanticized version often portrayed in modern media. Gladiators were not noble warriors fighting for honor. They were forced to fight for the amusement of the crowd. The origins of the gladiatorial games are somewhat obscure. Some believe the games were influenced by the Etruscans, an ancient civilization that predated Rome. Others trace the origins to the early Roman Republic, 
where the games were held as part of funeral rites to honor the dead. Regardless of their origins, by the time of the Roman Empire, the games had become a major public spectacle, drawing tens of thousands of spectators to watch men fight for their lives. Clearly, pitting a scrawny slave against a bulked-up prisoner of war doesn't seem right, does it? Did these men at least get the opportunity to prepare themselves? Well, gladiators were all trained in specialized schools known as ludi, where they underwent rigorous physical training to develop strength, agility, and combat skills. However, no matter how skilled a gladiator was, their life was always at the mercy of the crowd and the emperor. A thumbs-up gesture could spare a defeated gladiator's life, while a thumbs-down meant death. To add fuel to the fire, the games were often rigged, either to ensure the survival of popular gladiators or to enhance the drama of the spectacle. Gladiators could be given weakened armor, poison, or otherwise sabotaged to ensure that the outcome of a fight met the expectations of the crowd and the emperor. In this way, the games were a form of political theater, reinforcing the power dynamics of Roman society. The life of a gladiator was brutal and short. Though there were rare instances where a gladiator could win their freedom, the vast majority met their end in the arena. For those who survived one fight, there was always another waiting. And this time, as the gates open up and you take a stance preparing for your next opponent, through the fog you see a lion, imported from Africa, just for you. The Colosseum was also the stage for a much darker form of entertainment, the Venations or wild beast hunts. These hunts were one of the most popular events at the Colosseum, drawing massive crowds to watch exotic animals from across the empire fight each other or be pitted against gladiators and condemned criminals. Lions, tigers, leopards, elephants, and even crocodiles were brought to Rome from as far away as North Africa, the Middle East, and India. These animals were kept in cramped, inhumane conditions before being released into the arena. But the hunts were not just about displaying power. They were also about reinforcing social order. Condemned criminals and prisoners of war were often thrown into the arena to face the animals, serving as a brutal reminder of the consequences of defying the empire. The spectacle of death was a powerful tool of control, used to instill fear and maintain the status quo. In addition to the wild beast hunts, the Colosseum was also the site of public executions. These executions were carried out in the most brutal and humiliating ways possible, with criminals being crucified, burned alive, or torn apart by wild animals. The violence of the Colosseum reflected the violence of the Roman state, and the games were a powerful reminder of the consequences of challenging imperial authority. While the games happened above, more mysteries took place beneath the arena's floor. Called the Hypogeum, the basement was a complex system of tunnels, chambers, and cages that added drama and suspense to the games above. The Hypogeum was a two-level structure filled with passageways, cages, and holding cells where the gladiators and animals were kept before being released into the arena. A well-oiled machine that added an element of unpredictability to the games. Gladiators and animals could be released at any moment, creating a sense of suspense and danger for both the fighters and the spectators. The Hypogeum was also a place of death and mystery, with many prisoners vanishing within its depths, never to be seen again. The Hypogeum was also a testament to Roman engineering. The system of trap doors and elevators was a marvel of ancient technology allowing the Colosseum to stage increasingly elaborate and dramatic spectacles. On another note, though it is easy to focus on the bloodshed and cruelty of the events staged at the Colosseum, the Hypogeum also represents a remarkable achievement in Roman engineering. A system of water channels and vents that help keep the Colosseum cool and well-ventilated, making it a remarkably advanced structure for its time. 
Even today, parts of it remain unexplored. New secrets are often uncovered about its design and use. So yes, the Colosseum was obviously amazingly built, and as much as it was the Empire's source of entertainment and splendor, it would become the source of its demise. By the 4th century AD, the Roman Empire was in decline, and the Colosseum, once a symbol of Rome's grandeur, began to reflect the empire's growing instability. As the empire faced increasing financial strain, the cost of maintaining the Colosseum and organizing the elaborate games became a burden on the state. The lavish spectacles, once used to pacify the masses, now contributed to the empire's financial woes. One of the most significant political strategies associated with the Colosseum was the policy of bread and circuses. This policy aimed to pacify the populace by providing free grain and entertainment, diverting attention from the deeper problems facing the empire. The games became a tool for emperors to distract the masses from the corruption, economic instability, and political chaos that plagued Rome. The rise of Christianity also played a role in the decline of the games. As Christianity spread throughout the empire, moral and ethical questions arose about the violence and cruelty of the spectacles. In AD 325, Emperor Constantine, the first Roman emperor to convert to Christianity, outlawed the gladiatorial games, marking the beginning of the end for the Colosseum as a venue for bloodshed. Over the following centuries, the Colosseum fell into disrepair. Earthquakes, fires, and neglect took their toll on the once mighty structure, and much of its stone was repurposed for other building projects throughout Rome. However, despite its decline, the Colosseum remained a symbol of Rome's past, a monument to its former glory and a reminder of the brutality that once took place within its walls. Today, the Colosseum stands as a testament to Rome's history. Though no longer a site of bloodshed, it continues to draw millions of visitors each year who come to marvel at its architecture and reflect on the darker aspects of Roman history. The restoration and preservation efforts that began in the 19th century have helped protect the Colosseum from further decay. Today, visitors can explore the arena, walk through the Hypogeum, and imagine what it must have been like to stand in the center of the Colosseum, surrounded by thousands of spectators cheering for blood. It is both a marvel of engineering and a reminder of the cruelty and violence that once defined Rome. The Colosseum may no longer echo with the sounds of battle, but its story still resonates today. As we look upon its ruins, we're reminded of the rise and fall of one of history's greatest empires. Bye for now.